chest day today. So if you remember my last back workout, it wasn't actually the best session. I was feeling a little bit off. So I took yesterday off instead of training. I was meant to do this workout yesterday by my plan. But again, a plan is only there as a guide. Your most important thing is not how well you can effectively follow what's on paper, but how you can learn to auto-regulate and know when to push and when to pull back. So based on my own biofeedback, I don't need to track anything these days, but if I was to, I could have checked things like my resting heart rate or my resting HRV um, to see where my recovery is actually at. But I just knew it wasn't a good idea to be training yesterday. So I took it off. I'm still wondering, is it from that food? Is it from maybe deadlifting prior to that? That was a pretty hard session. I'd pushed in terms of that much intensity and volume at the same time with isometrics as well. That tends to be pretty taxing. So maybe there was some flow on effects from that. Either way, today I'm going in with an open mind. So I did mention in my last video that I was going to keep going with the same kind of um, training program, training style in, in terms of intensity and reps and sets and volume. I was going to keep that for the rest of the week and not just mix it up because I do believe that the worst thing you can do is just be reactive all the time and constantly want to change things. I think when something doesn't go to plan, even though it might be a sign that it is time to change the programs, which is close to that point for me, I still want to give it an honest shot and say, you know what, it might have just been I need an extra day's rest, it might have been that change in my diet. So I'm going in planning on following what I intended on doing a week ago. However, I also have the mindset where if I get moving and things aren't feeling right, I do have a backup plan in mind on how to modify things um, preemptively so I can go in and not just be beating a dead horse. So I know in my head, if I go in there and things aren't moving the way they should be in terms of speed and explosiveness, that I'm gonna mix it up straight away instead of trying to stick with my same targets from last week and wind up hurting myself. I think that's a really, really important thing to be thinking about. As important as it is to have a plan and a guide and a set routine to be following, you do need to know how to break those rules. So one other thing I had a couple of people asking me about was exercises. If you've looked over my last few sessions, there's been three, maybe four exercises at absolute most per workout. I'm not jumping around to different machines and different angles all the time. Doesn't mean that I don't do that, it just means that through this phase, I don't see it as necessary. Especially when it comes to uh, base building and strength development and intensity, you don't want to be doing so many different exercises. Just accruing more volume and sets and variety for the sake of it is a complete waste of time. There is a time and place for that, and I will be putting that in down the track. So you're gonna see in my future videos when I switch over to my next phase and, and start to transition out of this work, you'll see some more volume, you'll see some more sets, you'll see some more work being accrued over the training cycle. But for this phase in particular, and for most phases, for most people that I program for, you'll be surprised how little you actually need and what happens when you start condensing things down. You don't need two hours in the gym. You don't need five, six, seven different exercises for a muscle group. You can hit it if you've got the right approach with a lot of efficiency. What we're trying to achieve here is a very targeted contraction, a very targeted training effect. You don't need to be wasting your time and effort and precious resources, which is most important. Remember that your body only has finite amount of resources to be putting towards growing muscle, to be putting towards burning fat, to be, put, to be putting towards recovery as well. So if you're taking those resources away and just wasting it in terms of inefficient exercises and just accruing more and more exercises for the sake of it, you are going to be limiting your ability to build muscle mass. That's why, especially through this phase, there are only two, three, four exercises at most and maybe about anywhere between eight to 16 sets at absolute most. Again, like I'm saying, that's not permanent. That's not going to always be the case. Um, and that doesn't mean that that's the only way you should be training. Training is a constantly organic, dynamic, growing organism. It should always be changing. It should be fluctuating through different periods of intensity, higher volume, lower volume, lots of exercise variety, or no exercise variety whatsoever. Some of my best workouts have just been one exercise for just a few sets. Whereas some of my equally as good workouts have been about a dozen exercises or more. 
and 30, 40, 50 sets in a workout. So it's not about what you're doing, it's about why you're doing it and when you're doing it and when it's appropriate. So again, something for you guys to think about. One thing I'm interested to hear about from you guys is in your programs, how many exercises do you normally do per body part? How many sets do you normally do per body part? And why do you do that? So let me know in the comments below and I look forward to reading that. For now, let's get into the session. All right, so starting off today's workout with some isometric drills. So what I'm doing here is I'm pushing backwards and forwards in that horizontal plane into that rack. You can do this anyway. You can do it against the wall. You can do it in a squat rack, barbell as I'm doing here. Doesn't really matter. The fact is you just want some sort of immovable object to push into to create just a very light isometric contraction that you're going to hold for about five or six seconds. So I'm holding this at an intensity of about three to five out of 10. I'm not cranking maximally. I'm just feeling around, playing a little bit with the height of my hand as well to hit different aspects of the pec, um, pushing backwards and forwards just to create some neural stimulus to the pecs when I'm pushing inwards. And when I push outwards, it helps to wake up some of the, uh, the external rotators and the rotator cuff, the rear delt muscles, some of the scapular retractors. You just get this nice general wake up through all the surrounding muscles surrounding that uh, that shoulder joint. So I find with most people when they're doing their chest work, there's a lot of instability at the shoulder joint and there's a lot of poor firing of the pec. Now it's typically the instability at the shoulder joint that then sends a message up to the brain that the shoulder joint is weak and the brain then sends a concurrent message back down to the pecs saying don't fire up as efficiently don't uh, recruit as much as you could because you might end up damaging that weak unstable shoulder joint so doing drills like this just sends that proprioceptive that neural cue up to the brain that it's okay to wake up its required motor units so once I did that, uh, went into some barbell incline pressing as my main movement for the day, my main strength-based exercise. So just going through the motion, uh, I want you guys to pay attention here to that uh, angle, I guess, from the side. You would see my elbows, my wrists, and my hands, and the barbell, it all lines up in a straight line. The common mistake you'll see people make is the elbow drifts backwards behind the barbell or slightly forwards of the barbell, and and both of those options take some of the tension off the pecs and it creates a lot more instability at the shoulder joints and it can create a lot more extra force going through the elbows, whether it's the brachialis or the brachioradialis or actually like the bicep tendons or the tricep tendons and it can end up giving you a lot of issues with, uh, with injuries, overuse injuries accruing over time and you're not necessarily realizing where it's coming from. So here I'm focusing on making sure everything is stacked up properly to target the pecs efficiently in a, um, in a strength-based exercise. So between all of my sets, I was staggering in some rear delt work. As you see, I'm doing it quite loosely. Form isn't as important. I'm not trying to make it a strict technique-based exercise. I just want some sort of general blood flow through to my mid-back, rear delts, upper back fibers, just to keep some general stability going through those regions to help balance out the pressing work that I'm doing. Now, one thing I want you guys to look at here is my feet. You see how I'm elevated up on a little bench there. That's not just <clears throat> that's not just because I'm really short. I mean, partly because it is, but it's because I want to put my pelvis into a particular position. If I bring my feet down too low, my pelvis would go into more of an anterior or forward tilt, and that would create a bigger arch through my lower back. Now, a common complaint a lot of people have um, is a lot of weakness through that lower back region, a lot of pain there, a lot of pinching there when they're doing these kind of exercises, or there's just a, a lack of rigidity and stability through their midsection. The next time you do your bench pressing, I want you to get into position and then touch and press on your abs. It should be rock hard. If you're arching up and extending and flowing your ribcage too much, you'll find that it's very squishy. But if you get to a point where your legs are slightly further forward and your pelvis is in a bit more of a posterior or flex position, you should find that 
um, the abs are a lot more rigid and taut, which is going to yield um, more stability through the scapula and a stronger press. So I went back here between sets to my isometric drills. You would have seen me palpating through my midsection as well on the opposite side, um, just to make sure that contralateral and that opposite side um, abdominal wall is firing properly in terms of that external oblique because that shares a fascial sling with that left pec and that left shoulder region. So that is a region that I felt for me was getting a little bit unstable. So I threw in the stability drills again um, just to make sure I was getting the right effect. Just because you start out a exercise or a, a workout feeling really good and refreshed and warmed up doesn't mean it's going to stay like that through the entire workout. So it's up to you and your due diligence diligence to know how to um, go back to the prehab activation drills as you need to throughout the workout to make sure things still feel good. And as a result, this set here flew up so much stronger than the set that I was doing preceding that. So in terms of loading, this is still that strength phase I'm trying to do. So as long as things are feeling good, I'm working up to a hard five. And then once I hit that weight, I drop back uh, to, to three reps and I continued loading up to find another maximum. And that was where I was going to call it a day, which was on this or the, or the following set where I hit that top three. So again, pay attention. The midsection is staying taut because my feet are elevated slightly to help me brace through my midsection. I'm thinking about not letting my ribs flare up too much, but they will flare some. As long as that midsection oblique region stays tight, I'm making sure the elbows stay directly underneath the wrists, which is in line with the barbell. I'm not letting them drift forwards or drift back, which is the tendency for them to do to try to shift tension away from the pecs and to allow the traps or the shoulders or something else to take over. So always, wherever you're doing the heavier set or the lighter set, make sure the technique looks very, very similar and you are using the same um, movement, the same motor recruitment pathway across the board. Just showing you guys here just a slightly different trajectory, pulling from the sides and pulling back towards the hips for a slightly different effect on those rear delt flies. So after um, the uh, pressing Things weren't feeling the best. I was progressing and getting stronger, but at the same time, me having to go back to the extra stability work and the fact that things just weren't in that groove took me longer to warm up. I knew that it probably wasn't ideal to be going into my traditional um, dumbbell pressing and chest tips that I'd planned out, and it was time to shift up towards some more voluminizing work. So I'm moving over here to... Um, sets just straight sets of eight to ten reps on the guillotine press instead of instead of my typical ramping sets of six to eight reps on some dumbbells and dips so with the guillotine press again elbows stay tucked in line with the wrist underneath the barbell but this time i'm trying to bring that barbell down towards my neck or upper like collarbone region you can't really see the angle here unfortunately but that's what i'm trying to do and also that bar is nowhere near my chest it's not touching my collarbone it's about a fist off from touching it due to my own restrictions in flexibility and mobility so as a result, I'm here doing Lu raises in between from Lu Zhao Yun, the Olympic weightlifter. So it's just an overhead lateral. However, the trajectory of the, uh, the plates as opposed to dumbbells does offer a better loading stimulus for the infraspinatus and the uh, teres minor and the subscapular, so those rotator cuff muscles that are important for stabilizing the shoulder joint. Um, so I really like to do that and I find that it really helps to provide a lot more stability and strength. If you were to use dumbbells, it would give you a more targeted effect on the delts in terms of hypertrophy and a pump, but with the plates, it offers more stability. And you'll see here, you should notice I'm getting a lot lower. The barbell is coming past my muscle mechanic logo, whereas before it was pausing well above it. Because of that extra set that I did do of the Lou raises, and as my shoulders warmed up more and more and I got better stability of the joint, my brain sensed that stability and that safety and said to my, to my chest, it's safe for you to fire, it's safe for you to lengthen out and to open out and to lower that weight to a more complete range of motion. So on these last couple of sets, I actually was getting to the point where I was nearly touching onto my collarbone. Now, the reason we do that collarbone as the goal is it forces you to flare your elbows out wider. And what that does is it places a slightly deeper stretch, particularly through the upper pec fibers. It is an unstable position, so of course, be careful if you have pre-existing shoulder issues, but assuming you're taking care of that, 
and you're doing the right work in between, um, it's one of my favorites for building the chest. After four sets there of just straight eight to ten reps, I moved on to some Gironda, oh, some chest dips first and into Gironda dips. Uh, so you'll see here the chest dips um, focused on bodies flexed, I'm flexing the abs, head is down, knees are up high, and the elbows are flared out, just putting me into that nice position to be targeting the upper pec fibers as much as possible, stretching them out and getting a hard contraction. At the top, I'm thinking about spreading my scapula as far as possible and reaching my upper back towards the ceiling and hunching my body as much as possible. One thing to create that really, really intense contraction in the chest, but also to promote proper scapular protraction or the scapular wrapping forwards around the rib cage um, to make sure I'm getting proper firing of the serratus, which is what's going to help me in these following sets here that you see here, where my wrists are internally rotated excessively. Now, it's that inward rotation of the wrist that naturally flares out the elbow super wide in front of the body. You can try it sitting down watching this video. If you have your wrist in a supinated grip, your elbows are tucked to the side. When you bring yourself into a pronated or inverted grip as shown here, your elbows will flare right out and around. Now, as you do that, what that's doing is it places the chest in a position that where it gets this monstrous stretch and this monstrous contraction even more so like supercharged than the regular chest dip. Again, it's something that you do want to work into slowly because it can be very, very stressful on the elbows, the tricep tendon, and of course, it's very unstable on the shoulder. So you want to make sure you have proper, proper scapular stability. You want to make sure your serratus is firing properly, which is why I did a couple of sets of the um, regular grip chest dips just to make sure I'm getting that proper protraction and retraction through the scapula to make sure things are gliding properly. Once things are feeling good, um, I work through sets of five to eight, just with body weight, just as long as things are feeling good on the Gironda style dip here, um, keeping the, the same body position, everything flexed forward and staying in the range that felt really, really, really good on the chest. Final exercise, again, I've shifted over towards doing more, I guess, pump work at this point, which is not typical for this workout, but because I was changing things up on the fly in response to my performance in the first exercise, um, that's the reason why I'm doing this. So, incline short fly, focusing on flaring out as much as I can, letting the elbows track wide towards my ears. I am trying to keep, again, the same theme, wrist staying over the elbow at all times and letting it track out super wide to stretch out those pec fibers. If you look at any anatomy text, you'll see that the chest fibers don't run horizontally. They run in a fan-like um, trajectory, a fan-like line of pull up into, the, up into the, the humerus or the upper arm bone. And the incline short fly is just there to, to emulate and to track that exact line of pull that the, uh, that, 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 that the pecs have. So it's about proper alignment of the exercise to the, 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 ex, the, uh, the muscle you're trying to target. Mixing up my words there. Okay, so for the final downshift, as I'm always doing, some shoulder rehab, shoulder prehab. I did about 10 minutes worth of... Uh, barbell dislocates very very lightweight you don't need much weight here at all I mean it can be a strengthening exercise over time as well but at this point in the workout all I care about is just opening up my tissues so as I bring that barbell back over my body it's creating an intense stretch through everything that I've just worked but at the same time it is strengthening a lot of my muscles through the upper back and the rotator cuff fantastic exercise when you're doing this, make sure you are keeping your midsection taut, your abs flexed down tightly, even your glutes should be slightly flexed as well so you don't hyperextend through the spine. You want to make sure this movement comes from your shoulders and your thoracic spine, so that anything from the, the, I guess, the nipple line up, there shouldn't be much movement from the chest down through your spine. Pay attention here as well as I'm doing this to the way that I'm elevating my shoulders up to the ceilings. So every single rep, I'm shrugging up shoulders up towards my ears just like that just to preserve the joints so you're not cranking and grinding away on your ac joint and to create some space through uh through the shoulder girdle um, to make sure that you're not entrapping any nerves and entrapping any soft tissue or muscle and creating more issues
Okay, so it is time to start changing things up a little bit. I'm getting all that I really can out of this current phase of training for upper body anyway. I wanna talk just really quickly in the wrap up just about what's gonna happen with this transition now. Because a mistake that I've made a lot in the past and that I see a lot of coaches and just the everyday athletes making is changing everything. So they go through a phase, let's say we're going through a strength phase and they get all they can out of it and then they're like, okay, now it's time to go volume and they just flip the switch entirely and go to giant sets or super sets or something just completely unrelated. That is high volume. Now, what's gonna happen is straight away, they're gonna feel like shit, which is not necessarily a bad thing because you are changing your stimulus. So it is gonna create a new stress on the body, your body will adapt. However, if you don't go through some sort of stabilization or um, transition style phase, what's gonna happen is you're gonna lose a lot of what you gained over the last phase. So I do believe that for most of the time, what you wanna do with your training is bias one style of stimulus, whether it's heavy lifting or it's rest pause work, more mobility style, lower intensity work, more pump or innovation, muscle, mind muscle connection style training, or giant sets, metabolic work, whatever else it might be, I think you should have some sort of bias to one or the other because those certain goals will yield certain adaptations to your body and you'll want certain adaptations at certain points in your training cycle when you're striving for growth. Because let's face it, all of those things are gonna cause fat loss and muscle building, but to varying degrees and via varying mechanisms. So based on where you're at and where you want to be, you're gonna to choose to buy certain ones. That doesn't mean that you should, if you're doing a strength phase, completely disregard mobility or metabolic stress as a component of muscle building. That doesn't mean that if you're doing a mind-muscle connection priming style work, that you shouldn't still try to have some sort of strength component as well. But it's about the bias and how much of an emphasis you place on certain phases. So with that in mind, when I'm going into this uh, next phase now, I'm not going to completely mix things up. It's going to be a slow transition to slowly change how my body's responding. So I can accrue more volume and do slightly higher reps, but without completely negating all the work that I've just done over the last phase. So again, training can be dynamic. Training should be fluid. Training is something where just because one body part or one motion isn't working for you anymore doesn't mean you should throw everything else out the window. So I uh, hope you guys found today's uh, content really, really helpful. As always, you can leave any questions down in the comment section below. And I will see you guys next time.